Hi there. Thanks for joining us on Let's Talk Taste with Sherry, where we're saving the earth one flavor at a time by gathering community to share wisdom around the natural connections between our innate sense of taste and flavors that are grown in healthy, regenerative soils. Welcome. Hey there, Sherry Hess with The Flavor Remedy. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Let's Talk Taste with Sherry, saving the earth one flavor at a time. So today I want to talk to you about steak. When I think about steak, the first word that comes to mind for me is umami. So umami is the flavor of protein. You know, as I, as I move forward with this podcast, you're going to hear me talking about the five categories of flavor that we experience, salty, sweet, sour, salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. And umami is the flavor of protein. So on my last episode, I briefly discussed kelp as a source of protein and an umami flavor. And it reminded me of this, um, you know, the, the a conversation that we have around steak and red meat and this this importance and this almost opulence that we put around um, the experience of eating a piece of steak, right? And granted, I honor everyone out there has different dietary choices. Not everyone wants to hear an episode on steak and I totally get that. And you, if you are a vegan or a vegetarian and you choose not to eat meat, I totally honor you. Um, And I invite you to just stick with me for a minute here because where I'm going with the whole idea of the umami flavor is or is that we don't necessarily have to be consuming protein through the eyes of a piece of steak, okay? So, but let's talk about steak just for one minute. So when we think of steak, it's, it's this, if you eat meat, if you ever have eaten meat, you think of this big, you know, ribeye steak as um, a, a, a decadent, delicious, almost indulgent experience, right? There's steakhouses or some of the most expensive restaurants in, in, in our world, right? When you go to a steakhouse, you know, it's going to be this opulent experience. So there's a lot to talk about around what a piece of steak looks like. So from a culinary standpoint, when you're studying cuts of meat, and when you're understanding how to cook a steak, you recognize that the the meat that is the tenderest part of the cow, which ultimately is the um, the easiest to eat, right? It's the easiest to chew. It's it's the part that you don't have to do a lot to break down the muscle tissues, and it's the part of the cow that basically has been the least used. And suffice it to say that the less muscle mass, so like you know, when you exercise, you build muscle, right? Same thing for a cow. If you're going to build your muscle in a cow by, let's say, wandering a pasture like a cow is supposed to, (laughs) the meat becomes, the muscles become stronger and the meat becomes tougher and it becomes this more of a challenge for what we're demanding currently in our restaurants as, you know, this soft, succulent piece of meat. So, for example, the filet mignon is this cut of meat that comes from, basically it comes from like along the spine of the cow where there's not a lot of movement, right? It just kind of sits there and goes along for the ride. So that meat is tender and soft and easy to cook and with can withstand like cooking methods that are dry heat. They don't have to break down the tissue. And we can basically get away with not chewing it as much. That's kind of what, without us really realizing, that's kind of what we're asking for when we're asking for a tender steak. And if you don't really recognize that, uh, part of it is this awareness around the eating experience in general, right? So we think it's flavor. We think, oh, this is so delicious because it's, we're told it's delicious because it's tender, but tenderness has nothing to do with the flavor. So, there's a book called Steak, One Man's Search for the World's Tastiest Piece of Beef. And it's written by Mark Shasker, who happens to be one of my favorite authors on the entire planet. Um, and this book is fascinating because he went out on a journey to find the world's best piece of steak, fully expecting that all the marketing that we're all exposed to around you know, marbling and aging and tenderness and 
things that appeal to our sense of eating experience, he's assuming that all of those things that are happening in the world of um, in the world of beef manufacturing are going to be his best steak that he ever eats. The marbleizing, you know, the the all the stuff that we're told is, is something that tastes good in steak. What he found out that the best flavor was actually from, not to ruin the book for you, but actually came from, you know, the true grass fed cow that is eating what it's supposed to eat. That's wandering around that, you know, is eating grass and, and eating the plants and the omegas and the things that, that a cow is supposed to eat. Not only did it, does it create a more nutritious piece of meat, but it also gives it more flavor. Now you have to take the texture out of it because again, we've been programmed that the cows that we wanna jam into situations where they can't move so that they're not building muscles. Kobe beef is like the prime example of this, right? These are all examples of what I would not call living flavor where the animals are not thriving, where they're not contributing to a biodiverse situation, you know, growing, raising and growing a food situation. But we're told this is the delicious thing, right? Your, your experience of eating that steak is more about the texture than it is the flavor because the flavor is coming from whatever seasonings that, they're, that the chef is putting on your food and the fat aspect. So that food, you know, that, that meat that's being raised in a way that has more marbling, more fat in it, you know, creating what we think is this greater eating experience is introducing more unhealthy fats than you would get from a cow that is truly bringing in the nutrients, bringing in a more complex flavor than, um, than the cows that are raised in these horrible conditions, right? So this is, an, this is a great example. You know, Mark's book is a great example of where flavor is again, talking to us about this living capacity of our food. So it's more than just eating something that we think is a good eating experience. It's about really paying attention to the flavor. It's about really recognizing this umami flavor that is coming into the protein combined with other flavors. So I can imagine that the experience of eating that more flavorful piece of meat is, is a, it's really, there's more complexity to it than the fatty flat horrible conditions that a lot of our red meats are raised in. So another example of where you can distinguish living flavor versus non-living flavors, a, a, an animal that thrives, that is eating what it's supposed to eat. The steak is ultimately more flavorful, flavorful. It might be a little harder to chew, but you have teeth. You were born with teeth as well as taste buds. Focus on the flavor when you're looking for that nutrition and not just the textural experience. You know, and I could take this down a whole nother path here talking about the umami flavor and the flavor of protein and how we are really letting flavor be um, hijacked. And I do this with a term that I call the chocolate steak syndrome. So we're on the topic of steak here. I'll just kind of throw this out there. I'm sure this will be a more detailed episode in the future. But, you know, when we're when we're experiencing protein, we want to that umami flavor, right? This is part of the experience of eating a good piece of steak and recognizing, teaching our bodies to recognize flavor, right? When we taste umami, we, we want that protein. What the chocolate steak syndrome is, <laughs> is what I see happening in the health and wellness world, right? There's, there's a lot of information out there that's, that's supporting high protein diets. And in, these, in the process of creating high protein diets, we're creating these powders that are basically the equivalent like of a, of a shake, right? And it's the equivalent of a big piece of steak and when, it looks at, when you look at the grams of protein. But does it taste like a steak? No, it tastes like chocolate or caramel lattes or vanilla or whatever flavor of the month you wanna put on it because we know in our brains, because we've been told so many times that protein is good for us, but to taste it the way it is, the way they're processing it, they're weighing it, breaking it down, the way they're turning it into this powder, 
is not going to have an appeal to it. So they're going to start putting the flavor appeal on it that they know we love, like chocolate and lattes and caramels and vanilla. To me, I'm not saying I don't see why they're doing it because we're all trying to be healthy and we all think this is the way to go. But what it doesn't do is give us an opportunity to let our taste buds lead the way. Because now all of a sudden, steak tastes like a chocolate bar. And how do we teach our bodies how to eat intuitively when a steak tastes like a chocolate bar? Food for thought, I'm gonna leave you there. Thanks for joining me. Feel free to share with your friends, comment, tell me what you think. Um, looking forward to continuing this conversation around umami and protein.